So after years of playing around with Eslin rules, making TypeScript as type safe as possible, and also trying to minimize bugs and whatnot, I finally come around a good Eslin configuration. It is strict, I'm not gonna lie, but I feel like it's necessary if you want to promote good coding practices and you want to make your TypeScript projects as robust and type safe as possible. So for this, I have this slintrccjs file, and then I have this configuration where I'm using overrides to provide a specific linting rules for the different file types. So for example, here I have for common.js and for JavaScript. In this case, I just set the ECMA version to latest and no rules whatsoever. And as you can see, I did the same with MJS, except that this time I set the source type to module. So with that slint, instead of requiring this require import syntax, we use ES modules. But as you can see, neither of them have any slint rules. And the reason is because I want to enforce TypeScript and in the off chance you need to write a script in MJS, well, it really doesn't matter that much. If you really cared about the type safety, the robustness, well, you would write that script using TypeScript, not JavaScript. So that's why these two are empty. So with this in mind, let's move on to the interesting part here where we have TypeScript and well TSX files for React. So here, well, I just set the parser options. I said where the TS config is. So I use the path to join the directory name with the TS config that adjacent so that it is absolute and there are no potential issues for finding this TS config that adjacent file. And then I set the settings to be react. And then I set the version to be detect. And then we have the parser, so TypeScript slint parser, and then I have some plugins. Now, as you can see, I only have three plugins. I have the TypeScript slint plugin for obvious reasons. I have Tailwind CSS because that's the styling method I'm using. And then I have the plugin for React. So as you can see, I'm not one of those who have over 50 different slint plugins. Now, the reason is because I noticed that the vast majority of those plugins are so incredibly specific, it really depends entirely on what you're trying to achieve. So there is no one size fits all Eslin plugin. So for this, I like to keep it simple. And so I only have these three plugins. Of course, if I weren't using Tailwind, I wouldn't have this whatsoever. And well, same with React, I would have the view Eslin plugin or whatever. But of course, we need to extend our Eslin configuration. So here I bring over some recommended rules for TypeScript Eslin, and then the same for Tailwind, and finally for React. So we do not have to specify all of those rules manually. That's already being brought over by the Eslin plugin. And well, since I'm using Next.js, I just have the Next Core Web Vitals extended plugin. So now let's move on to the rules. So here I have a lot of rules. As you can see, the file itself spans over 183 lines in total, but I have them all divided. So let's start with the basic ones. We have the ones for Tailwind. So since we're using the plugin for Tailwind, we can use this class name sorter so that we enforce that the order of the classes are correctly applied by Prettier. So if I come here to my Prettier configuration file, as you can see, I added the Prettier plugin Tailwind CSS plugin. So when we save our file, it is going to automatically format the Tailwind classes. Now, this is controversial. Many people say you shouldn't be using Eslint to enforce what can be achieved via formatting. And you're totally right. I despise Prettier in your Eslint configuration. Eslint should be worried about fixing bugs. So in other words, linting your project. Meanwhile, Prettier should be concerned about about formatting your code. So in fact, we should get rid of this rule. Now you can find this configuration file in the description, so make sure to grab it. And then I have these other two rules. However, you can check them out in the official documentation. So here in the GitHub repository for the Eslin plugin Tailwind CSS, you can find all of the rules and what they do with respective code examples. So here, incorrect code and correct code. So make sure to check it out. 
Now, one of the rules I have for TypeScript is no default export. The reason is because named exports are better. Why? Because what you're importing correlates one to one to what is being exported in that file. But if you start mixing default exports with named exports, it can become a huge mess, especially when refactoring a module. You may change the name of a module, but since you know default exports do not enforce names, then you will have some imports that are outdated in the sense of the name being outdated. So it might not represent exactly what the module is designed to do. Because, well, if you change the name, that means that maybe the behavior changed. However, for Next.js, since you need to use export default for certain files, what I did was override this rule. And so for page layout and not found .csx, I simply set the imports no default export to be off. Now for the React ones, I have the prop types to be off. They're not necessary, especially if you're using TypeScript. Then JSX key to be error. So when you're mapping over and returning elements, you need to add that key so that React can identify each element. Then we have no useless fragment. So if you wrap, say, a div with fragment, but that's the only element the fragment is wrapping, then why are you using a fragment in the first First place. So I just set this to warn, then no array index key. So I set this to warn because sometimes it's just better to use the array index as the key, but most of the times you need a unique key that identifies the data exactly. So for that, I set this to warn, then no deprecated to warn, no unused state for error, so pretty self explanatory. Then button has type, this is just to enforce good accessibility. Then display name to be error when you're using, say, forward ref or something of the like. Next, we have JSX fragments, and then I set this to be error and that we must use elements instead. Now, as you know, fragments allow you to group multiple elements without adding an extra DOM node. So for that, all you need to do is just say this. And now you can have another div parallel to this element and do whatever you want without rendering that extra parent div if we were to use a div in this case. But as you can see, we get this error and we get prefer react.fragment over fragment shorthand. So here we need to say react.fragment. Now the reason I prefer this over the shorthand is to make the intent clear and it is also more readable. And not only that, with this explicit one, what you can do is provide a key. So I do not want to see in my code base, sometimes using this shorthand and then for the times where we need a key, we then use use this explicit syntax. So I want to make my code as uniform as possible and less things to worry about. If I need to use a fragment, either with a key or without one, well, I just use react.fragment. I do not have to go around perhaps in the future refactoring things to then change it to this syntax instead if I need a key in the future. So again, the key is consistency. Whatever makes the code as consistent and as simple as possible will improve the scalability and maintainability of your project. Now, in this case, this is unnecessary. So if I save this file, well, Leslint is going to remove that fragment for us. Now, we then have this React in JSX scope. And so I turned this off because, well, with modern React versions and build tools, it's no longer necessary to import React in every file that uses JSX. Then I have the JSX curly brace presence. Now, this is enforcing the correct usage of curly braces in JSX. That means that if I were to come here or create a component, so const component react.fc, and then we return a div, and this div has a class name, so flex item center, and that's pretty much it. As we can see, there is no need to use curly braces here. They are unnecessary. 
So if I fix this, it is going to remove them for us. However, in this case, they were necessary because we're escaping it so that we can use the CN function. So this is nice to have. Then I have the JSX Boolean value. So this enforces the shorthand syntax for Boolean properties in JSX. So for example, if this component, so component props is equal to enabled, and then this is a Boolean, for example, and then we say component props, and we just take them in, and then we render the component. So for example, here, if I wrap this up in a fragment, and then I say component, and then we need to pass in enabled, we can say enabled false, or we can say true. However, this can be simplified with the shorthand. So we can just say enabled, and that in itself is already passing a true value. Next, we have no direct mutation state. So this prevents direct mutation of the this.state object in React components, but well, you won't really see this in the wild unless it is very badly written. Then we have self-closing component. Well, that is for components that do not take in any children, or at least not those that are defined explicitly here. So for example, here in this case, there are no children, so there is no need to have this open. So we can simplify this and use this shorthand instead. But in the case that we do provide children, so children, and then we take in the children here. Well, in that case, it is not going to be enforced because, well, it has children. But of course, this can also be simplified by doing, say, props. And then we have, we spread over props. And well, this is going to pass in the children automatically. So again, it is not necessary. Here we can say children is equal to props.children. So this is what I'm referring to. Both are totally fine as long as well we use this shorthand. And finally, for React, we have no unknown property. So this prevents the use of unknown DOM properties in JSX. And that's pretty much it. Now, as for TypeScript, well, this is very, but very exhaustive. As we can see, we have a lot of rules. However, some interesting ones could be equal, equal, equal. So we do not use double equals, but rather the strict comparison operator. Then we have the dot notation or objects. So if I have an object like this, so object, high, and then high, and then I say object add high. Well, this can be simplified by using the dot notation. Unless, of course, we have a property like hello world. In that case, we cannot say hello world. We must use this one instead. Next, we have no useless catch, then prefer const. This one is very important. So if we were to change this to let, as we can see, we get object is never reassigned, use const instead. So here we can fix this automatically. Next, we have consistent return. So in a function, we always return a value such that we do not get possibly undefined. So for example, here, function add to numbers, and this will return, say, a number, and then takes in A, then B number, and then you say if a is equal to or type of a is equal to number and type of b is equal to number. And this could be instead unknown and unknown, then we can return a plus b. And if not, we do not return anything. So we can say or undefined. However, as we can see, we get this error expected to return a value at the end of the function. And the reason we do this is for clarity, because sure, at first glance, we can see that it is just returning a plus b if a and b are of type number. But what about the unhandled case? Well, for that, we must explicitly say return undefined. However, for this, please use null instead. And then next, we have no restricted imports. So only for patterns that are like this, so that we must use absolute imports with the path alias in the TypeScript config file. Then we have, well, the no default export that I was talking about earlier. And then no plus plus. So for example, let incrementing value is equal to zero, then 
plus plus as we can see we get an error saying unary operator plus plus used no plus plus so for this we must say plus equals to one and well for this i disabled it for four loops so allow for loop afterthoughts then we have the strict boolean expressions so we cannot say for example const possibly a number and this is null and we initialize it with null what you could do is say if possibly a number then log possibly a number plus five but as we can see we get unexpected knowledge value in conditional unnecessary conditional value is always false here. well in that case let's actually change this to or number and this is a constant so let instead and for this, we get the strict Boolean expressions error. So we must say is different from null. And now that error went away. So we must be very explicit, such as to avoid a number possibly being zero. And we know zero would be null if we just say if possibly a number. So we need to be explicit in this case to handle the null condition accordingly. And well, I have more, so no implicit coercion, no explicit any, return await, no var, prefer const, as I said, no duplicate keys in an object, no duplicate imports, no unreachable. So for example, here in this function, if we say return five, this is all now unreachable. So no unreachable code. And there are a plethora of other ones. So if you want, well, you can look them up in the official documentation. And if you perhaps do not like a specific rule, well, make sure to update it accordingly. Anyway, this wraps up the video. Remember, you can find this configuration in the description. I hope that you enjoyed the video. I'll see you in the next one.